Hello and welcome to this special Blackwell Online Classics podcast. My name is George Miller, and I'm delighted to say that my guests in this programme are the authors of the first volume in the Penguin History of Europe series, Simon Price and Peter Toneman. Their volume in the series is entitled The Birth of Classical Europe, a history from Troy to Augustine, and as such, it covers a vast sweep of some 2,000 years of European history. All the more remarkable, then, that they didn't simply confine their purview to the Mediterranean basin, but look far beyond it to explore how the civilizations that sprang up there interacted, traded and fought with peoples all across Europe and into Africa and Asia. Nor are they content simply to establish what happened when. Among the major attractions of the book is the way in which the authors show how a civilization's past is a dynamic thing, constantly in a process of reinvention and recreation. One of my favourite moments in the book demonstrates, though, that it wasn't always possible to use the leverage of the past for one's own ends. The authors relate how in 86 BC the Roman general Sulla appeared before the walls of Athens to suppress a revolt that had sprung up in mainland Greece. The Athenians pled for their city to be spared, citing the illustrious exploits of Theseus and Athenian heroism in the Persian Wars. Sulla, unmoved, explained that he had come to teach the Athenians a lesson not to learn ancient history. But that, of course, did not mean that the Romans themselves were any the less susceptible to deploying their own historical myths when it suited them. Nor did it stop later peoples doing the same. The final attraction of the book I'll mention before I play the interview is its inclusion of some of the many later ways in which the classical past has been appropriated and used, often to unedifying ends. The Nazis found great appeal in the rigours of ancient Sparta, Mussolini invoked the glory that was Rome for his own dubious purposes. When I met Simon and Peter in Oxford this week, I began by asking them about the image that appears on the book's front cover, showing a vase painting of a young woman, Europa, and a bull. Here's what Peter told me. We start the book in the, uh, in the preface by talking about Europa, the uh, figure who, at least today, has come to symbolise the continent of Europe and the European Union and is being used in all sorts of interesting ways by the, uh, the European Union as a personification of the, uh, of the continent. Right at the very beginning of the book, we argue that that conception of this mythological figure, Europa, a Phoenician priestess carried across the sea by Zeus in the form of a bull to Crete, where she uh, later became the mother of Minos, the founder of the Minoan civilization on Crete. That conception of Europa as, a, as symbolizing the continent is actually an extremely new idea. It's uh, seldom, if ever, used in classical antiquity, the myth of Europa to represent the continent of Europe. Indeed, that meaning is really only something that's emerged within the last hundred years or so. And given that one of the main themes of the book is the way in which people recreate and change and rewrite their own pasts over time. The idea of Europa and what, if anything, she has to do with Europe seems to us to be a rather nice summary of what the, what the book was trying to do. You say in the first chapter, in the beginning there was Troy and the Trojan War, and it seemed to me from reading the book it would be difficult to overemphasise the importance that sort of event on the horizon had on later culture and later self-images of, of people and self-definitions. Can you say something about just why that is such a significant point of reference really throughout this book? The Greeks had a sense of the past and senses of the past and the construction of the past is one of the main themes of the book. The Greeks had a sense of the past that stretched back continuously. The further back you go, the more fuzzy it was. But they could put things on a. T they came to put things on a t on sort of timelines, and by the time we get down to the timeline of the Trojan War, they th reckoned they knew things about the about what what was going on. That for them was recoverable history. It was remote, but they had Homer, of course, to guide them and other things too. And it's the events of the Trojan War and the fallout from the Trojan War, which for them. Uh, is one of the touchstones of their historical past. And what did it enable them to do, or what did it enable them to conceptualise and envisage? They were able to relate themselves to that heroic age. Some people in Greece of the 6th century BC believed that they, they, they were descended from, literally descended from, heroes of the Trojan War. They 
18th generation from Ajax or whatever it might be. So they're claiming linear descent and the prestige that goes with that. They're also claiming at the communal level that their communities were relatable to those heroic days. Perhaps it would be helpful to give a concrete example of this. After the Persian Wars, the Greek defeat of the Persians in 480-479 BC, the Greeks started thinking in terms of uh, an eternal dichotomy, an eternal conflict between Europe and Asia. And one of the ways in which they thought about that, something with which they, which they thought with, was the Trojan Wars. The idea of the Greeks sailing to Asia, Troy, of course, the uh, far northwest corner of Asia as conceptualized by the Greeks, and defeating the Asians, the Asiatics, the Trojans. Now, that meaning of the Trojan Wars as the beginning of a great conflict between Europe and Asia, Greeks and barbarians, is not there in Homer, but nonetheless, the Greeks of the fifth century, in thinking about the Persian Wars, chose to think about it through and in terms of Troy and the Trojan Wars. How useful is this sort of dichotomous way of thinking in the ancient world? Because it seemed it seemed to me that that was something which runs through many of the chapters, the sense of belonging to a particular community and those who are outside it, or other ways of, of splitting the world into, into two Greeks and barbarians or men and women. One dichotomy that we concentrated on a good deal in the book is the dichotomy between Europe and Asia and at a, a slightly later period, Europe and Africa, which is enormously important for the ways in which Greek, Roman and other communities are thinking about themselves and their neighbours. Eric Hobsbawm says somewhere that Europe is a, a political programme pretending to be a geographical expression. And that I think is a really, what we think is a really interesting way of thinking about Europe, that there is no Europe objectively defined by geography. Europe is a way of thinking about us as opposed to a defined other. And certainly that's one of the major themes that we were trying to explore in this, uh, in this book.